Welcome to the Iron Edge podcast, all about unlocking your full potential inside and out of the gym. Our guest today is the owner of Titan Barbell in Stone and Mass, Eric Dawson. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Thanks for uh, taking the trip up. So let's just dive into the gym set of stuff first. Sure. Yeah, so obviously, you know, being a gym owner, you've owned, how long have you owned Titan for? Uh in a month will be 10 years. Damn, nice. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you. Because you used to have it outside or inside your house? Or not? Yeah, was in my garage. In yep. your garage, okay. Yeah, for about almost four years. Nice. Yeah. So what was the like? What was the starting point? Like, why did you get into it? Because obviously you've been in strength sports for, I mean, hell, as long as I've known you, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then I know that from like some stuff we spoke about previous, like you were, you played football in, in, in college. Yeah, correct. So um, I guess if you want to go back even further um, in high school, obviously I started strength training. I got into that for football. I fell in love with strength training even before I played tackle football, ironically, because I played uh, flag football in middle school. Okay. Um, and was introduced to strength training the summer before I started playing football in high nice. school. And that really, I just kind of caught the bug there um, and loved weightlifting. And then obviously played through high school, uh, played in college in North Dakota State University. And then once I was done in college, moved out here and just wanted something to keep the competitive juices flowing. I was just li literally lifting in a Bally Total Fitness, yeah. uh, which some people might not even remember at this point. They're defunct, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I was talking with a coworker of mine who said, uh, you know, I said, I've always wanted to get into strongman, right? I love watching it growing up. I think like a lot of people did. I said, I'd love to do it. He said, there's a gym that, that teaches people how to do that not too far from here. So I went over and... Um, hired a coach to, to teach me how to do all the events. And as they say, the rest is history. Yeah. So what did you go to college for? Because were you, were you strength and conditioning based No, stuff? actually, I went uh, for physical education and health education. I was a school teacher for a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. How was that? Uh, it was fun. It was stressful in a very different way. Because yeah. part, um, part of my job, I was working with everything from kindergartners to seniors in high school in the weight room. Oh, okay. Right. So making that mental shift for how you interact with kids, mm -hmm. you know, you, obviously you can't interact with a kindergartner the same way you can with a senior in high school who's screwing off in the weight room. Yeah. Right. And back and forth. So literally every single hour I'd go from like a high schooler to a third grader, you know, to another high school class to working with middle schoolers. And each one of those, obviously developmentally, they're so different. And mm -hmm. how you'd interact with each of those um age ranges is going to be different as well. So mentally it was a lot more stressful, honestly, than almost any other job I've had. Um, really? Not the physical toll, yeah. but the mental toll is just, I was just, I don't think I've ever been more wiped at the end of, uh, at the end of each day. Yeah. Um, well, it's like a mental gymnastics. Yeah. Bouncing back and forth. Yeah. Um, so did you do that out here or when you're back? Because you, are you from Dakota or North, No, North I, South? I grew up in Southeastern Wisconsin. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, so once I once I moved here, I lived on lived in Manhattan as well. Okay, um, that's where. So uh, if we want to back up, my wife and I met in high school. We were friends, um, dated throughout college, long distance throughout college. Uh, I moved back to Wisconsin for a little bit. She was still in Manhattan. Okay, um, she was uh, working there, and then I got sick of being long distance, so I moved out there, taught school out there, actually outside of the city in uh, Terrytown, and. Then she wanted to go back to graduate school, and that's what brought us to um, to, just, Mass. to, to Massachusetts. Nice. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, and then that's where I looked for teaching jobs, but the closest one I could find was like Western Mass, and I wasn't about to commute, you know, two hours plus every single day, uh, each direction. Um, so I did, honestly, I dug ditches. I did temporary construction work mm -hmm. just to bring in some money at that point. Um, and then once I just, uh, after a little bit of that, that's when I got into um the coaching side of things, being in the gym. I was like, all right, what did I enjoy doing? What aspect of that did I enjoy? Um, so that's how I got into coaching people. I was like, all right, it's just teaching people in the weight room, right? Yeah. It's really no different in, in that aspect. Yeah. And then that's when you started things at the at the house in the garage? No. So I worked at, I actually worked at a belly total fitness for almost five years, six okay. years. And then from there went over to TPS, worked yep. there um, for, I want to say it was about three years. And then from there, uh, I opened up out of the garage. I opened up a, a small personal training studio. That's honestly what I envisioned it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, all right, I'm going to give myself like three to five years to kind of get this off the ground. And either it's going to sink or swim and yeah. go from there. Um, and then within that time, 
Um, I think just because at that point I had collected a lot of equipment, a lot of the big dog equipment specifically, so yep. like really nice equipment mm -hmm. to train on that they were using at nationals at the time. And between that and then, you know, um, just expertise, a lot of people ended up just kind of coming and training out of my garage. And um, we, after, yeah, after about three, three to four years, we just kind of, we were so busy. I mean, there were Saturdays where we legitimately had 20 to 25 people training out of my Damn. out of my house, right? So Cause, uh, cause that's the thing. I remember when you moved the gym. Because yeah. you got, did you got, like, you got mandated, didn't you? Yeah. So, again, for the record, like, I thought everything I was doing was above board, right? Yeah. Like, I had, from day one, set up an LLC. I set up, a, I had insurance. I thought, you know, according to all the, you know, the bylaws, you know, that I read, like, everything was according to to code. Yeah. Um, I don't know. They The city didn't feel it that way. Um, and that, they honestly didn't even want to. I just had one neighbor that was just, he was just cranky and needed something to do, candidly. Yeah. Yeah. Um and it's whatever. Um, yeah, but he just kept making enough of a stink. And they were like, yeah, you can't do that. And I know that they didn't want to. They actually even told me. They're like, we've been fielding calls from this guy for a long time. And we just, we don't want to put small businesses out, right? Like, because yeah. it, it's not as if the whole community was coming and saying, hey, stop, stop it. It's literally one person. Yeah. Okay. Right. Anyway, yeah, the gym was getting busy enough that I'd wanted to kind of shift into a bigger space anyway. I just didn't want to obviously have it be <laughs> forced upon me. Yeah. Because um, I had no idea. I remember like when you moved, I was like, I had no idea this was out of your garage. Yeah. Because everything I'd always seen, I was like, this is a nice spot. And it's like, yeah. it looks like a big area. Yeah. And um, see, so yeah, I had no idea. And that's the thing, like when you come, like we were talking about, like before we got rolling, like the rent side of stuff. Yeah. Especially like, you know, if I could have done like my the gym in Washington and had like done what you did, where it's a case of garage, you build the client base and you build the income to sort of support a bigger space. Yeah. hundred percent the smartest thing to do. Cause otherwise yeah. you're like, Oh shit. Okay. I need to, how many memberships do I need for this mem for this, uh, what's it called for the overhead now? Yeah. And it's just such a stressful thing. Yeah. A hundred percent. I also felt like part of the reason why I did that was, um, I felt like I could make penny mistakes instead of dollar mistakes. Right. Yeah. We're all going to make mistakes in this process. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know anybody that just n makes every single right decision from day one and doesn't lose money on certain decisions they've made. <laughs> Still lose right? money at times. You know, so for years I was like, all right, I'm going to learn mm -hmm. and make penny mistakes instead of dollar mistakes. That's so smart. when I when I have to make the, you know what I mean, like that jump and everything being a lot more serious, um, I'll have made a lot of those mistakes and learned a lot in that process. Yeah, that's actually really really smart way to look at it i never and I, I never really looked at it that way the, the penny versus dollar mistakes is actually a, a nice analogy um so then moving the gym how how much bigger did you go so out of my garage i was about a thousand square feet okay um and then i had an office upstairs there's an old carriage house okay i had an office upstairs and then uh, some outside space as well i don't i mean if you want to consider my driveway but in terms of actual inside space about a thousand square feet good um and then when i first opened up the the gym i took on it was about 3800 about just okay. under four thousand. nice yeah so that was um that was definitely a, a jump but part of the problem was in finding a space i was down for almost 10 months Oh, wow. Yeah, looking for space. Because I didn't want to just... Part of the problem was I'm just north of, of the city in Boston mm -hmm. by about 10 minutes. Um, in that area, in a lot of the area, there's either 20,000 plus warehouse, which is way too big, mm -hmm. right? Especially in this area for rent. Yeah. Or there was 1,500 square feet of a storefront, which was never going to work for me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. for one noise, all that stuff. And I didn't want to go from from what I had to just barely bigger than what I had. I wanted to be able to go to a space where I was, we can do all the outside stuff that we used to do inside. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was very hard to find something in that in that kind of like three to 5,000 square foot range mm -hmm. or three to six. Yeah. Um, and I ended up just, uh, I was actually looking at another space. I didn't love the the agreement, the rental agreement on that candidly, it was too much favored towards the the landlord to a point where they, without no, with 10 days notice, they could kick me out and I'd still be responsible. Right. So I was like, I didn't feel comfortable with that. Yeah. Right. Especially with this type of, you know, type of gym, like there's going to be noise yeah, right? Exactly. dropping no matter what you do, no matter how much you mitigate, how many mats you stack mm -hmm. up, there's just going to be noise. And I didn't want that to come back and, and bite me. So yeah. I ultimately didn't do that. 
And I still remember the day I like sat down. It was a Sunday night at like 10 o'clock. And I was like, let me just look again. And I randomly just Google search, right? I forget what the exact words, wording I used. I found the space that I'm in now. And I was like, oh my God, this looks perfect. Yeah. Right. I went the next morning and, and looked at it and uh, it was a, like a dance studio at, formerly. Okay. <laughs> but even then, like I walked in, I saw the space, I saw the front. And I was like, this is it. Yeah. Like I, the vision of the gym was already in my head at that point. And I was like, we'll make this work. Right. Like obviously going from no extra rent to, <laughs> to having a rent, you know, um, yeah. was a big jump, but I was like, we'll make this work. I, I can envision the, the place being here. Nice. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like when I, so when I moved out to, uh, you know, New England from, uh, from Washington state, mm-hmm. finding property even then was terrible yeah. you know and it's like i had need like, like we weren't really making noise or anything like that so it wasn't like i had some constraints that you had but everything was the same deal like here's storefront and it's like you got 1500 square foot of storefront and then maybe you know 800 in the back I'm like that doesn't work at all yeah so like i was the same way like found the one like next door initially and it was open aside from like bathrooms in the middle this is perfect. This is yeah. this will work for the gym side of stuff. This will work from a shelving and and, and inventory side. And it was like I said, it was, it was the same as you. I walked in. I was like, "Yep, yeah, this is it." You yeah. Know? Same same when we went when we moved into our second spot um, next door. Same deal. Walked in. I was like, "Yeah, this is really gonna work." Yeah. And you can see how you lay it out, and that was the nice thing. One hundred percent. Um. So obviously, with the gym, you're doing a hell of a lot of contests as well. Yeah. Um, you just ran two parallel of the meets, and then you've got strong. You got strong man this weekend. Yeah, this up that's what Saturday. I thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then that's so that's Clash of the Titans, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, Clash of the Titans five. I was going to see how yeah. many how many is that you've done. Yeah. And you've done so you've done all of them inside the gym. Did you did you ever run anything before the gym? Yeah. So actually, my first the first Clash of the Titans, um, I ran while I was at the garage, but uh, a friend of mine. Uh, Rita had a CrossFit facility in Burlington, Mass. Okay. That um, I knew her from a previous gym. So she had actually approached me and said, hey, if you'd ever want to consider running a contest, you're you're welcome to, to use the space. So that was huge, right? Because nice. I could see what – I had helped run contests with Murph at TPS before. Um, but this would be the first time I'd go out like totally solo mm-hmm. on my on my own. Um, and I was very fortunate Rita – offered that, you know, that, that branch, um, for me to take. And that was a huge way to kind of know, all right, this can be done. Yeah. Right? Once well, things like running a con, like everyone, I feel like everyone wants to run a contest mm-hmm. at some point in time. Yeah. And then when they do, they're like, Oh my God, like this is completely different from like, you know, what I was expecting. Like, you know, even no matter how many times you compete, mm-hmm. you're never going to get that sense of actually what goes into putting the event together. A hundred percent. And was that your experience, like, you know, running the contest solo versus like with Murph at TPS, where it was a bit of like, a, oh shit, there's so much more that I forgot about type of thing. Hmm. It's a good question. I I don't know if it, if I felt that much of a overwhelmed at that point. Mm-hmm. Part of that is just because, um, I guess anal, you know, whatever you want to call it, like attention to detail. Yeah. I was stressed about, I stress about all that kind of stuff when I run something like that yeah. uh, from day one by myself. So, uh, and that hasn't, that doesn't go away by the way, at least for oh, me, yeah. no, no. <laughs> right? Like I'm just as stressed to, you know, this week as I was, you know, seven years ago or whatever when I ran the first one. Um, but part of that is just because I care, right? Like, and I don't mean that, I, whatever, I don't care, but I, I give a crap, right? Yeah. And I give a crap specifically about the athletes, mm-hmm. right? Like, how does this impact the athletes? Because I still compete myself and I still want that to be. I think sometimes um, too often when contests are run, it's kind of like, all right, the, the operations don't consider what happens to the athletes. Yeah. Right. So I think just still competing. I, I never want to lose that even when I'm done competing. Mm-hmm. The idea of, all right, how does this actually impact the people lifting on the day of the contest? Well, it's that and then it's like event order. Like how many, how many contests do you go to where it's like, well, hell, Worlds was a really good example. We're going to do nickel, nickel walk, mm-hmm. and sorry, or Webster stones, nickel walking stones, whatever you call them. And then the next event's a deadlift. Yeah. You know, I'm like, you're sort of doing the very similar movements there, you know? Yeah. Because um, what was event three? Event three was the sandbags on, on Correct, day one, the right? Yeah. So you could easily have switched those and had a bit of a move, like a lighter moving event, and then into deadlift. But, yeah. you know, 
I think a lot, and that's where you know the operation side of stuff is similar, really, or not similar, but like exactly what you're talking about. Where okay, yeah, we can set it up this way, and it's going to flow really well for TV, or it's going to flow well for whatever from an operation standpoint. But then on the the converse side, the athlete experience is a little bit off, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um. So getting into so like yeah, you just said that you still compete. I know last year you did. You did OSG last year, am I right? Am I, I didn't do. I did America's Strongest Man last that's, year. That's okay. I, I that's where I'm thinking. Year. Okay, so you did America's, and then you did some grip stuff last year too. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I honestly, all this stuff is just blending. Together. Yeah. So right. I did. I did uh, grip at the Arnold this that's, past year. Yeah. Um, or you know whatever two months ago. At two this months point. ago. Okay. Cool. Um, and then I didn't do the Olympia with grip because that was the same time as America's Strongest Man. So um, that was at yeah the Olympia the. Uh, super series is what they call it. Um, so I didn't end up doing that. Did I do anything else grip wise last year? I don't think so. I honestly, I just, the grip stuff I kind of fell into yeah. in the pandemic. I just, a friend of mine, um, Rich DiSafani had, had invited me to a local contest. He's like, Hey, I'm doing this grip thing. You have pretty good grip. You want to come and do it with me? I was like, sure. Right. So with like a week's notice, I just went and hopped in and did it. And, and I, I enjoy it, but it's not really a passion of mine. Yeah. Um, it's kind of something to do, uh, on the side in between the strongman stuff. Um, so that's kind of how I hell of a done. grip. I mean, like, I do. <laughs> like, well, I've got a good grip. I'm like, yeah. I'd say it's a little bit more than good. Yeah. Yeah, fair. I mean, I, I, I yeah, it's, I guess, world class. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, but it, again, it goes back to like, I, I, I do enjoy it. Um, but like I said, I, I think I can um, squeeze a little more juice out of my strongman career, whereas yeah. I think grip, grip seems to stay with you a little longer in life. Right, so plus uh, it has a hell of a lot less taxing. Yes, You're like huh? Because I mean, how 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 many years are you looking at doing uh, like having been involved in strongman now? Over 50, 15, 16. Okay, Let's see. yeah, so a hell of a long time. Yeah, how are you feeling? Like you've you know obviously you've accumulated injuries and and you know beat the shit out of yourself to be yeah. mildly over the last 15, 16 years. How are you finding? the longevity side now on this end of the career like are you are you are you dealing with anything where like you're hindered by it long term like you no know, for like me you know it's it's no bicep at the top and the proximal end of, or like a knee and stuff like that are you have you been unscathed so, so to speak a little honestly a little bit yeah like and from the major major stuff right i mean you you can't go through this sport and not have aches and pains and, yeah. and setbacks and Injuries that take, you know, maybe longer than they did when you were in your 20s to recover from. Um, but I've been fortunate enough to be, I mean, I guess part of what's helped is just be intelligent with my training. Mm -hmm. um, part of it, you know, we had talked about a mutual friend of ours, Andy Triana. Um, he's been a coach of mine now for uh, a handful of years. Yeah. And part of it was, you know, in the early part of my strongman career, I'd, I had worked with a guy named Mike Pelosi. He taught me another really intelligent guy. Uh, he taught me the events. Then for a while, he and I would collaborate and then he kind of, I just did my own training and programming. Um, and then it got to a point where I knew if I wanted to stay in this sport long term, I needed to put that into somebody else's hands who the answer wouldn't be more. Yeah. Right. Uh, I got to do more. I got to just, I know how to beat the shit out of myself. Right. And I think a lot of athletes do. Me too. <laughs> and I think, right. Like, I think if you get to a certain point in the sport, you kind of have to have that ability too. Yeah. I think if you don't have that at a certain point, like you'll never make it to the top. Well, end that of the was going to be my question. Where I was like, you know, I feel like, at least in my experience, at the front end of the career, you have to just go hard all the time, beat yep. the shit out of yourself, and build the base because then, you know, at the other end, you know, if you're pulling eight hundred, for instance. It's a hell of a lot harder to put 50 pounds in an 800 pool than it is to put it on a 400 pool. Yeah. You know, so like how has your training changed as you've progressed? Obviously, you beat yourself to, to crap, but then do you sort of like looked at it from a more longevity standpoint? Yeah. So a lot of it right now, I mean, both, we're, I guess we'll talk like in season, off season, right? Like yeah. now my, my preps are a lot shorter than they ever were. Right. So like I, I, you know, um, some people go 12, maybe sometimes up to like a 16 week prep. I, I think it's a little long for strongman personally. Uh, but a lot of people do like a 12 week prep. Whereas like now I'm looking at closer to like a six week prep, maybe eight max, um, for a contest. Is that down more to be simply based upon like, you're proficient with events and all that sort of stuff. So it's more of like, it's a six week refresher 
type of thing, yeah. if that makes sense. Like, and you're just peaking those movements. That's, that's it. That's a big part of it is, yeah, I don't need to learn how to do yoke again. Yeah. Right. Or I don't need to learn how to do arm over arm pull again. Mm-hmm. I, I know I have proficiency with those movements. It's a matter of just kind of, like I say, like to, uh, like to say, knock the rust off of the events. Right. Like yeah. sometimes you're like, all right, I haven't done this event in three years. Right. Mm-hmm. And the first week you do it, you're like, hmm, that's not great. And then, <laughs> right. For, or for the way I used to be able to do it. And then by week, I always say like, when you reintroduce event after like, I think more than a year of not doing that at a specific event, week one always feels like crap. Week two is like, okay, that felt better. Week three is like, I'm now starting to feel like myself. And mm-hmm. then usually by that fourth week, I'm like, I'm back to where I was before. Yeah, yeah. Right. And being able to handle what I was before. Yeah. And that's the same thing. You know, I had like, I did yoke a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, this feels fucking awful. Yeah. Like how the hell did I ever run with a thousand pounds? Yeah. You know, you got 400 pounds on your back. And that's the exact thing. Like it's like that reintroducing, knocking the rust off and, and actually just feeling it's it's part of us like feeling uncomfortable again like yeah. being being okay with that uncomfortability yeah. um so i know we said that you've got um feffer yep or fifa how yeah, do you FIFA, how, yeah. how, how, how you pronounce it um and so that's at the end of june you're doing the stroma stuff and the stones of, stones of strength yeah with the stroma cup is that is that scl this this year no, uh, just that's just thing. so Kiki and Eggle. Yeah, I don't know if you know them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know them. Um, so that's the contest they run. It's just yeah. Um, the the one I'm doing is called Trolls and Titans. Okay, is the name of the contest. Okay, because yeah. they used to have it. Did it used to be? They they have SCL? done. They have worked with um with the SCL before. Yeah, uh, both doing I think a winter contest. They may have done a summer, but I think yeah. mostly winter contest. Okay, yeah, there. that was yeah. I think it was the strongest Viking. I think it was. Yeah, that one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I actually did that two years ago. That's well, well, last, last year. Did you yeah. do that? How was that experience? Oh my God, so much fun. I, that, that was from the day I got into the sport, I remember seeing something um, where they had done something like that there and I've wanted to, I've wanted to do that. Yeah. Right, to go out in 20 degree weather and, and do strongman on the snow, on the compacted snow slash ice. and mm-hmm. Just, I don't know, but it, the, to have that challenge and do something in such a different environment, right? Like I, give me those environments over another convention center any day of the week. Yeah. Right. And I'm not, I'm not like shit talking conventions that I get it. Right. Like I'm just saying for my own personal edification, yeah. like, you know, when I'm, when I'm, you know, 50 years down the road and I'm looking back at my career, I'm not going to remember a convention center in Phoenix as much as I'm going to remember the mountains of Norway with a lake in the background. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or like out in the Philippines or in Dubai mm-hmm. or right. Like Ukraine, Uzbe- yeah. you know, like, all those places, like I, those memories are all burned in my head of like, oh my god, this like amazing Capitol building behind me. And, yes. Yeah. And I, I'm it's exactly the same way. Like, yeah, okay, I remember the convention stuff, but it's just like it, it all looks the same. Yeah. Whereas you know you compete in China or you compete in Indiana or wherever the hell it yeah. is, and it's a completely different. It's a different vibe yeah. of contest as well. Um, how do you feel the sport? And obviously, like you know, talking about the convention center stuff. How do you feel the sport has grown the last since, or not since since you've been in it? I was going to say the last five years, but realistically, since you started, yeah. Because obviously, I mean, coming from the UK, it was a lot of like parking lot shows, yep. Not really convention center stuff, uh, and then coming over here, that was the the other side of it was you know like at least the higher level stuff was convention centers, yeah. Um, when did that really? Stuff, was that was that the same process of like you know you started and it was all parking lot stuff and then it got into convention centers? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I was during that. I was in there during that time where they. I'm not saying they haven't had convention center stuff before I did the sport. Obviously, yeah. they did, but it went from it was a rarity to now a lot more common for the higher level stuff for yeah. anything that isn't a local show, yeah. right? Yeah. To be in a convention center, um, and to just have a more professional feel overall. And I guess along with the convention center. Um, having built in crowds, right? When yeah. you're, when you're in a parking lot and to a certain extent, this happens at other things, but, um, when you're in a parking lot, it's the people's, you know, it's the athletes, friends and family that are there. Right. So if you've got 50 competitors, you're lucky if there's a hundred people in the crowd, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, 150 people. Whereas if you're in a convention center, maybe somebody came to go watch, um, you know, Flex Lewis on stage and then they happen to walk by and you're like, oh, what's this? Yeah, right. And then yeah. they'll stop for 20 minutes or half an hour and all of a sudden, you know, a crowd builds. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that's the, like, the, talking about like the Arnold specifically, like that's the exact, like the best example with it, where like you walk in and you're like, oh, what's this? What's that? And it's, it's almost like you're bouncing between things. Yeah. But I think it helps overall because then it's, it's, just, it's such a new, it's just a diverse audience. Mm-hmm. 
that it just bring the potential eyes to the sport goes through the roof. Yeah. Um, so with that, I mean, do you have any, obviously you run everything out of the gym. Mm -hmm. Do you have any aspirations of building into convention center stuff or? Yeah, it's actually been on my mind um, a little bit. I actually want to run, I don't know how much I want to put out there, but like I do want to run something bigger than what yeah. I do have at, at my place. Yeah. Um, because especially here in the Northeast, ever since the Europa in Hartford, um, okay. no longer has been put on. Or I least, didn't even know there was Europe in Hartford. Yeah, the Europa, yeah, in Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah. Um, that was, that was you know, kind of the, the last convention center thing that was held here consistently in New England. Um, so because of that, I, I want to kind of uh, fill that void mm -hmm. um, and run something where it's, you know, strongman, powerlifting, maybe, you know, some Olympic weightlifting, potentially kettlebell sport, because I know some people in, in that world. Nice. Uh, maybe even doing like a CrossFit competition. There's the venue I'm thinking about, like you could even from there do some Highland game stuff outside. There's a venue. I mean, there's enough parking like. So this could all happen in under one roof. That's cool. Um, so I, I, that's something that's been on my mind. I actually started looking into it, and then um, when the pandemic hit, that's I I was go I went to the, the that place and like all right like what are the numbers? What do we have access to this? And then and then everything started to shut down, and I was like, all right, I have to put a pin in this for a while. Right? Yeah, then, so you've been thinking about this for a long time. Though. Yeah, okay. for sure. So this nice. is something that I definitely. Um, I'd like to, I, that's kind of going to be hopefully maybe the next stair, stage of my career in terms of wanting to kind of step up the hosting side of yeah. things. Yeah. Would you, when you say the next stage of your career, are you talking about like after the competitive side or during or would, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. Because uh, I know we spoke about you being a master. Yeah. And obviously, but without any major injuries, you can go, you can still, you can repeat, I mean, hell, look at Mark Felix. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can go for as long as you feel comfortable. Yeah. Are you setting a time limit on that as well? I'm not. No, yeah. no. I, I uh, so I guess in terms of my next stage of my career, I guess from the promoting side of things is what I was talking about. Kind of wanting to say, all right, I feel comfortable to say that I, I run a successful local show. Yes. Right. And I know how to do that. Now I want to kind of push push the boundaries on that and say, all right, what's something, what's something bigger? And to do that, part of that, part of the reason that I haven't fully pulled the trigger on that is I don't want to jump in without being prepared. Right. We talked about that before. Like I don't want to half-ass anything. Yeah. Right. So part of that is I want to make sure that all the things I don't know, either I learn about those or have people around me that do know that and trust them and just kind of honestly like put together a committee to, to help so that, it's not something where I'm just like, oh, man, I can't believe I lost that much money because of all the things I didn't do. Like, it was more of a hope and a dream than an actual plan. And that's the problem. Like, when, you know, I've seen it even just recently, like, some people running contests and you hear, like, oh, yeah, I spent, like, 30 grand. I'm like, yeah. how? I'm like, yeah. how? How? Yeah. I mean, well, okay, let me sure. rephrase that. It's, a hell, it's not that hard to spend 30 sure. grand, yeah. especially when it comes to strongman. Yeah. But it's like, okay, how much did you lose? Where was your funding and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm, I would be in the exact same position where it's like, okay, if I'm going to do something, don't want to lose my ass in this. Yeah. Because there's one thing of like, okay, yeah, okay, we're spend, spending money on a marketing, or especially if it's like, you know, say for instance, like we did something bigger here. Yeah. We've got national exposure from like the brand side of stuff, whereas on a, from a perspective of your business is local, like the carryover is potentially less, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think, I think that's what people don't, think about times it's like yeah. you know oh, i'm going to run this contest i'm going to spend a bunch of money i'm going to run this fantastic contest it's like okay but are you covering your costs yeah you know, that's the biggest thing that's number one yeah and like you know you can't cover your costs and something like that from like from entry fees alone yeah you know yeah um because I, I i mean i don't even want to know what venues are like i went to like some stuff in texas last year and i heard the venue cost there and I'm just like, fuck. like yeah. no wonder your sponsorships are you know so high, so high. Yeah. But I completely understand why because you have to go in and you have to cover the cost. Yeah. Um. Because if you don't, then what's the point? You yeah. Know? Like you're just losing your ass. Um. So obviously, like we spoke about the contest side of stuff. Yeah. So you did the powerlifting stuff last weekend. You've got the strongman now. And then remind me what we spoke off air, but now yeah. I'm not remembering. So you've got two more powerlifting meets. Is that right? And then yes. a group contest? I guess if we'll go in order, if I can remember everything. Um, <laughs> That's what you know, there's a hell of a lot on the plate. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm judging slashing uh, help run um, 
uh, Highlander meet uh, yep. with Josh uh, as part of the No Fame Games. Or, um, and that's in June. Yep. Then uh, in September, I'm running a strongman competition, more of an exhibition at a cigar expo. I was yep. asked to run that. So um, they'd asked me to kind of pick hand, hand, hand pick a, a handful of guys to do that as part of an exhibition. That'd be kind of fun because I'm hoping to kind of get a, a few events in there that maybe you wouldn't see regularly yeah. just because... You know, they did give me a little bit of a budget to kind of work with some stuff, and nice. I want to do it properly. Um, then from there, um, we're hosting two more powerlifting meets, another Powerlifting America meet and another USCPL meet. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a, another strongman contest. Usually Clash of the Titans is usually the the spring tent pole, and then the fall tent pole is I've had to kind of um, adjust each year. I've done a team contest, a five-team contest, yeah, a five-member yeah. team contest. That's been super successful. People have really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. um, set it up where you can create your team however you want. There's five members. Each member only does two events, and okay. nobody can do more than two events. So it's kind of um, – people are fun. It's it's easy to get people to buy in because you can even have, like, uh, a powerlifter come and join your team. Be like, all right, well, you deadlift, and we'll teach you how to do this sandbag carry. Exactly. Right? So it's yep. easy to, to grab a group of five. Sometimes when you do team events um, – it's really challenging if you say you have to have a heavyweight man, you have mm -hmm. to have a lightweight woman, you have to have this, right? Whereas uh, what I found to be successful is create your team however you want, right? You want five lightweight women? Awesome. You want five masters? We've had that in the past as well. Um, anywhere in between, right? We've had five 231 and under uh, men, right? Uh, and then each person lifts their weight according to their weight uh, weight, weight class, mm -hmm. and then they're just judged against that versus everybody else, right? So okay. if you can lift, you know, your 300-pound log four times, uh, this 125-pound woman lifts it six times, even though it's, you know, maybe a 130-pound log, 140-pound log, she would win that. She would get more points, obviously. Yeah, so you're just so. basically doing the scoring. You're I'm taking out all the stuff, and you just standardize the scoring. Yep. Like, okay, like your yoke is 300 pounds. You did it in 30 seconds, whereas yours is 800, and you did it in 32 seconds. She yeah. wins. Yeah, and then the way, the other way, the other kind of wrinkle with that is, so each team has two athletes that go out. Um, their ultimate score is their cumulative score. Okay. 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 So in the back in that example, right? If if she did six of six reps, and uh, her teammate did four, that's ten, right? Like. Now, if you did four on yours, but your teammate did seven, you would actually get more overall, right? Yep. Because you got eleven versus ten overall, yep. right? So it actually makes makes it kind of fun that that um, one person can't totally dominate, yes. right? You can kind of you can always kind of game the system, yeah. but for the most part, it has to, it actually comes back to like you kind of have to have no weak links. Yeah. Well, that was actually right? going to be my question because I know you've run the team contest for a number of years, but I was, I was never really hundred percent sure how you judged it and in such a way that it wasn't a fucking nightmare for you. It, it, it's a lot. I will say it's a lot of planning on my end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I enjoy it like in a weird way. Like, uh, I enjoy it. It's really stressful. And then I also enjoy it. Like come contest day, especially knowing like how much people really enjoy it. Right. And really can appreciate the work putting into it. And well, that's it. It's, it's such a different, um, type of contest. Yeah. That they're just not, they're not pop. Ugh. I don't want to say they're not popular. They're not common. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, I mean, and is that the rest? That's that's the whole competitive or okay, promotional so that, year? <laughs> so I may not even do the team one this year. So oh, okay. um, I've mixed it up. You you have an unfortunate history with one of the other ones I've done before. Which oh, yeah. Is a, uh, the, um, <laughs> a, the mystery. A, a mystery contest, event. Yeah. So that one, uh, dis despite what happened... Um, <laughs> I still really enjoyed it. And people hey, it wasn't, really, your, wasn't it, your fault. <laughs> it really, so, um, mystery event where literally the athletes did not, I didn't even know the events until six days before the actual event. Yep. I wanted to do it the morning of, but my scorekeeper was like, it would really help me out if we could know all the events ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was like, fair. So I'll do it. We did it six weeks out or six days out. Nice. Um, so just enough time where, like, you really didn't want to train, right? I wanted to set that. Uh, I was like, I knew if I set it two or three weeks out, people could at least get some training in on yeah. it. Yeah. And I said, all right, six days out, people aren't really going to go and ham, like, exactly. Yeah, they might, right? they might go and knock some rust off, yeah. but nothing else. And then how we picked that out was there was a, a, a press event. So you knew you were doing some type of press, some type of deadlift, some type of load, some type of, I believe it was a carrying medley, and then some type of, I think I put, like, miscellaneous, and then I listed all in that um, – in that spreadsheet, everybody knew what uh, what the possible events were going to yeah. be, 
And then I believe what the weights were. And I, I bumped the weights down from what I would normally run in a contest because, again, if you can't train for it at all. Like, I don't expect people to be at a peaked, mm -hmm. peaked level um, on six days' notice. Yeah, like you can peak to a certain extent. Yeah. But not technically proficient peaking. Yeah. And ultimately, that I, I like that because I, part of the reason I love the sport is the adaptability aspect of it. Yeah. Right? Yes, be strong, um, strong and specific. But like, I like the adaptability because there's plenty of contests. I'm sure you've done them too, where like um, the events have changed on me. Like the first SEL contest I did in, in Holland, uh, the six events we were told, I landed in Holland and three of the events were completely changed. Not just slightly. It wasn't just like, all right, instead of deadlift max, it was uh, deadlift for reps. It was, instead of that, it was like, all right, we're doing a truck pull now. <laughs> right? So all just complete, like yeah. three of the six completely different. But again, going back, I was like, all right, roll with it. Yeah. Right? And that was actually, I, I think part of that is uh, because I've always been able to adapt and just mentally go with that. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't bother me one bit and I it actually won that show. So like, yeah. um, part of that is just, and that, that happened too with, um, the, the plat plus where I turned pro. Okay. We, uh, we had, uh, do you remember the flipper, the tire yes, flipping simulator? Yes, yes, yes. That ended up breaking with, uh, one of the, I think leave the 175 group, the 175 men group. So they're like, all right, keg clean and press, uh, medley. Oh, shit. right. Yeah. It was a five keg clean and press medley. I had pressed a keg once before in my life. And so in, in that warm-up, they gave us, you know, a few minutes to warm up. And I was like, all right, we're going to learn right now how to, like, really be proficient with this. And I ended up um, working out okay. I ended up, ended up, I think, either winning that event or taking second in that event and, and winning overall. But part of that is just at various points in my, my career has just been you have to adapt. There's going to be changes, right? Like, one of the things I coach people on is just the only thing I can tell you consistently is something's going to change. How do you feel right? people... So that, that was my outlook as well, where you have to have the adaptability to build to like, you know, if an event gets changed or an order gets changed or whatever, an implement gets changed, yeah. then you can adapt to that and, and flip the switch and be still okay type of thing. Mm -hmm. How do you feel... And I don't want this to come across wrong. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel that the the newer breed of athletes deals with that? Because I feel like back in you know back in our day, age and myself, is that we didn't really ask for like how how tall are farmers? How then what's the th handle thickness? What's this? What's this? What's this? It was a case of okay, cool. I've got farmers walk. I've got a sandbag. I've got a log. I've got stones, and I've got whatever. You trained on the implements that you had. And then you went to contest and that was it. Yeah. Like when do you feel like that specific side of stuff, like or the 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 side of the the athlete side of specifically wanting to know all those parameters, when do you think that sort of came about and how do you feel that affects the 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 adaptability side of the sport? Sure. Um it's hard to say an exact date. Right. I'd say it probably would be honestly around the time that like it kind of went from like backyard contests, right. Or in, in parking lot contests to something more serious, a bit more professional, a bit more professional. Right. So that, that comes with it. Right. Like, and that doesn't necessarily, you know, when you have that transition that some things are good, some things are bad, but part of it is just, this is part of the natural progression, things that have to happen. Right. Um, there were people that complained back then too. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah. Like, let's not, let's not, uh, it's not as everybody's like, cool, we're all totally okay with this. Yeah. Right. Like there yeah. are people that would, oh, yeah. that would either complain or like, or mentally like short circuit if, yep. they, if it wasn't exactly what, you know, well, you told me it was going to be this set of farmers. Yes. It's not this set of farmers. Yeah. Right. You're like, yeah, I know what I said, but like, you know, be, in order to keep the show from running an extra hour longer, yeah. we're going to have to run these two weight classes on this set of farmers. Yeah. Or so, or you were supposed to borrow a set of farmers and they weren't there. Yeah, you know? totally. Somebody, you know, some it didn't come through or for whatever reason, right? Um, part of that too is I think that goes back to the sport where, like, if we look at the history of the sport, right, from 77, 76? 77. 77, yeah. yeah. Um, till... The uh, mid-90s, mm -hmm. 
right? There was no spe- specific training, no. right? Like, I, I don't know if this is official, official, but at least according to lore, like, Yoko Hola was accredited with the fir- being the first athlete to consistently train strongman events year-round. I was literally about to say that. That yeah. Yoko was the, from, from my knowledge at least, yeah. Yoko was the one that started actually having some form of equipment yep. to train on and be proficient on. Yeah. So it goes back to that in terms of like, for for decades, people didn't even have access to have access to the equipment, much less the specific type of equipment. Yep. Right. Like, well, this manufacturer's handles versus that mm-hmm. manufacturer's handles. Right. Um, so I think for a long time, because you know, from the you know the nineties and then that kind of the people that kind of came up through there, that's when you started to kind of see that transition a little more to like mm-hmm. actually caring about what type of equipment you yeah. used versus like this is just what's available to us. Part of it is a matter of like, it's not as if people didn't have preferences back then. It was just literally was not available. Yeah. Right. So you're just like, oh, here's, uh, here's something that I didn't know existed five minutes before to now people, people know because they have a choice and they've used six different manufacturers of farmer's yeah. handles. And they know that this set of farmer's handles feels better for this and that. And if we do turns versus straight runs and right, like turns is not something you even see. I, I no, like, like, no, I love, it. I actually do like, it, I but, like turns, yeah. but I, I could probably count on one hand the amount of times I did a, a farmer's walk with a turn in, yeah. in my career. Yeah. I like it because of, again, it goes back to the skill aspect of yes. it. You know, I think, obviously, the name strongman, right? Like, you have to be strong. But I think a big aspect of the sport that's often overlooked for a lot of athletes is the skill, mm-hmm. right? And that's where something that I think I've been able to make up a lot of ground. Because when you look at, like, my gym numbers, like, on a barbell, I get blown the fuck out of the water by most heavyweights. Yeah. But I can stay with them because of the skill of a lot of the odd object, mm-hmm. a lot of the odd things and picking up and understanding like, all right, when you do a turn with the farmers or when you do this with the yoke or when you're doing an arm over arm, like all those little things where like their brute strength doesn't help. And that was right? the same as me. It's like on a different level um, or I guess a similar level with with the gym lifts. Because I was a younger athlete, like I started strong at seventeen, yeah. and all these guys are you know mid to late twenties and or above and all that sort of stuff. So I didn't have that brute strength, power, yeah. uh, and 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 you know top end numbers. So I I learned how to be proficient. Like I taught myself to push jerk. I taught myself you know okay I need to I need to be faster than everybody else. I need to be more explosive. Blah blah blah. And it's the same, exactly the same thing. Like I was either keeping up or winning contests because of those reasons. Versus being just, you know, brutally strong and being able to muscle everything. Yeah. It, and uh, uh, along that same line, like I said, there's a point at which, like, having more strength, ironically, doesn't help. It's, right? It's a weird, like, balancing act. Like, yeah. you can be top end, but if you can't translate it into something, then really it's it's not usable. Yeah. How do you coach your athletes from the from the adaptability standpoint? That's a good question. As much as I can, again, people are ultimately yeah. going to make the decisions they make. Uh, for my own training and then, you know, the suggestions I try to make is do everything from, like, use different pieces of equipment, mm-hmm. right? We're fortunate enough at the gym, at, at, at Titan, we have a lot of pieces of equipment, different, different logs and, you know, different 10-inch logs, different 12-inch logs, different dumbbells, different this, that, um, I tell them, use, use different stuff week to week. Like, if you're far enough out from the contest and you have no idea who the yeah. manufacturer is, like, one week, use, you you know, use this log. This and The next week, use this log. All right, this week, you're going to actually take the mats and go to a different part of the gym and look at a different wall. That's this a mat, time, Yeah, that's a big, right? I didn't even like, think about that. So I've done that personally. Um, or, I'll, I'll, or if I'm lifting on a platform, I'll turn around. I'll face the other way. Mm. Because in the contest, I'm not going to be looking at the same spot on the wall in my gym. Well, that's it. Right? Or if I can't, it's a little harder at the current location, but when I was out of my garage, like, I'd go outside. If you've never been outside and done a contest outside and you look up on log and that that sun is staring you right in the face, right? Like, little things like that, right? Like, because, you know, or even if it's not the sun, it's just, like, perspective of, like, how your brain processes the walls around you Mm -hmm. versus, like, Oh my God, there's all this open space right now. And and you get up there, you get a heavy enough log on your chest and you're out there. Like that can throw you off for sure. Because well, it did for me the first yeah, time I went like, outside. Whenever right? I compete outside, I was like, please let it be a cloudy day. Yeah. Let it be a cloudy day because then I can focus on the cloud yeah. versus just complete open blue sky. Mm-hmm. Um, because then you, you at least have some sort of focal reference. 100%. Um, 
And it's stuff like, you know, when you're talking about like the differences, logs and stuff like that, it's like, how many people have you seen train on a metal log their entire prep and go to a contest with a wooden log and they can't even clean it yeah. because the hand, like you, you're not putting your hands in, or like the old school mm-hmm. logs where you, you know, you put your hand inside and the opening's so small that you're slamming into the sides of the log and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And with, you know, the, the handle set up on, especially Steve Slater's logs, you don't have any of that. Yeah. You know, it's a completely different ball game. Yeah. With, the gym getting in away from like the training side of stuff but more mm-hmm. into like the, the business side of it um because i try and talk not just be like the podcast about like going hey what's your favorite event and all sure. that stuff yeah <laughs> which, which, which by the way just my own two cents on that when people say what's your favorite event what you're really what they're what you're really asking is what's your best event and when yes. they say what's what's your least favorite event what's they your give you your worst event right yeah. like nobody says they're they're their worst event is actually something they're uh, they're really good at. Vice versa, sorry, I yeah. said that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Nobody says uh, this event I'm really shooting at, but it's my favorite. Yeah, right. It's like I really enjoyed. You know, I'm trying to think. <laughs> like I sort of enjoyed truck pools, but yeah. they were never my best event yeah. from like a body weight standpoint and all that sort of stuff. But my favorite event was yoke because I was really yeah. fucking good. Yeah, at, you know? <laughs> yeah, naturally, right? exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, on the business side of stuff, like what have, what have you learned over the years that like so say someone's like you know. They want to. They want to open a gym. Yeah. What was your advice? Sure. So the first thing I tell people is start as small as possible. Yeah. Right. Um, not just because of the way I did it, but uh, in learning from from people, um, not even in like the strongman world, but in the in the gym world, like Eric Cressy, uh, Mike Boyle, mm-hmm. uh, other people. That that was something in reading upon the business side of things that they did was grow with demand, mm-hmm. not with want. Yes. Right. So start as small as you possibly can, right? And honestly, that might be a storage storage unit. Yeah. Right. Um, start with a storage unit, right? They can be relatively cheap. Throw some equipment in there. Train from there. Train people out of there. Like so it maybe at a commercial gym, right? Like sometimes when uh, I guess when we talk about a gym, like I guess there's two routes, right? You can go the the gym route where you are an active coach. In that gym, or you can go the route where you're the owner and you just provide all of the equipment and open the doors. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna step aside or I'm gonna go to one side and say, as a co- as an active coach in that gym yourself, right? Because mm-hmm. that's that's what I did. That's what I have experience with. Yeah. What I tell people is go get go cut your teeth at a commercial gym because you're never gonna have as much exposure to number of people yeah. as you would at a commercial gym, right? And like I did at Bally's or at. Mm-hmm. Um, like lifetime fitness, right? Like the amount of people walking through the door and you will cut your teeth and, and develop the skills on how to actually work with somebody. Like have somebody come in, have a goal, right? Have them help you know, attain that goal mm-hmm. and work with people that are, candidly, it, it's honestly a, a lot harder that are working with people that don't actually want to be there yeah, than people that do. Oh yeah. Good right? Idea. I'm fortunate now that like I'm at a point in my career where like I don't have to work with anybody that doesn't want to be there. And anybody who comes into my door wants to actively wants to be there and uh, train for whatever it is, whether it's a competitive strength sport or not, right? Um, so learn the skill of coaching somebody because yeah. a lot of times, just because you're a good athlete doesn't know doesn't mean that on the back end of it you know how to work with somebody. Yeah, right. You could be a top level athlete and you can learn stuff. Don't get me wrong, but the skill of coaching somebody is completely different than competing yourself. Oh, massively. And I right? think that's, what, that's that's a big pitfall that a lot of athletes, I feel, fall into, where it's like, oh, I'm gonna, I wanna be coached by X top level person. And then like, programs are terrible. I'm like, yeah. well, what, what what's their experience from a coaching standpoint? Sure. Um, or maybe the program is, is awesome, yeah. but the interpersonal skills, the ability to adapt, yes. all yep. that stuff is, wanting yeah right so i guess to go back to that um gain skills like i said as a coach from there open as small a space as you possibly can you know get clients from there refer like keep mm-hmm. building up slowly from there because that's a lot of times people are like well i want a facility like this awesome can you afford like can you legitimately afford that can you afford that during the lean times yeah, like yeah. the lean months and years right like and then grow with demand. Like every, at every point from the garage to even my current space, I took on a few other smaller additions. Mm. Not right away. They were all offered to me initially. And I was like, I'm not going to do that right now. Because yeah. again, while while there's a massive allure to have more space, 
it doesn't come with free rent. Like it's not exactly. like, oh, you can have this extra room for free. That doesn't happen, no. right? Like, like maybe hey, it does. Maybe for some people it does. I know for me, and I think for most people out there, it's never happened for me. <laughs> that that does not happen. Yeah, right. Um, so start small and grow with demand, not with not with want. I think that's a massive thing that, or a pitfall, a massive pitfall that people fall into is that they view it from a perspective of, okay, well, I want th- I want all this equipment. Mm-hmm. So they have to get this massive space, but then they I, like even some of the stuff I've got in, in our gym. Like I bought it because I wanted it because I've trained with different people and, and yeah. trained in that stuff. But when I was doing my own programming, sure I would use it. Now some of that stuff never gets used. And yeah. I'm like, Damn it! <laughs> you know it's great to have, um, but from purchasing the equipment to then having the space, and if you're not if it's not getting used, you know you're just paying for nothing at that point. Yeah. And I think that's something that people fall into where they want that fancy facility, but the membership isn't there type of thing yeah. for it. How was that when you opened the new gym? Like, because obviously if you've got, you know, a bunch of people come to the old the garage space, yep. did you have to, was it like an oh shit moment of, okay, now I've got this rent to pay, the membership needs to jump by X amount or coach coaching um, uh, clients? Sorry, I need to uh, like I need to expand my coaching base by, you know, fifty percent. Did you have any of those moments? I uh, it wasn't so much of an oh shit again because I tried to plan all that out. Yeah. Right. Like when I opened up that space, I actually had three numbers in my head uh, in terms of number of active uh, in a couple different categories. Number of active members. Right. I had three. Like all right. This number will, will get me to the bare minimum. Yeah. This is this will get me to this, and then this this number was is that kind of like. Once I'm above there, then I know everything's everything's in the black at that point. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Um, and then that again, like I said, for for both active members, coaching clients, those types of things, I kind of had all right. In order to make ends meet, these are the things I need to do, and I want to. I have a general goal of when when I want to meet those by. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and then um, I guess going back to the equipment side of things, part of the thing is uh, that another piece of advice I would give people is, don't get sucked in by fancy equipment right away. Right. If you've got if you've got a uh, an angel investor, right, that said, here's a half a million dollar check, buy with it what you want. Awesome. Right. Uh, you know, I, go, I go didn't. crazy. <laughs> yeah. I didn't. I don't think most people do. No. So, um, scour used equipment. What my, mm-hmm. One of my things that I always say is, steel doesn't go bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like um, a good chunk of my my uh, forty five pound plates were from Merrimack University. Right. Okay. Through a friend of a friend, a friend of mine, Jamie. I was good friends with the head strength and conditioning coach there. Just the, the you know, it's luck. Part of it's luck. Part of it's, you know, keeping connections, keeping your ear open, eye open. Um, he said they're upgrading their weight room. They'll give you a, a really good deal. I, I got, I forget how much equipment, for about three grand. I went out yeah. and that weekend after I picked all of it up and I went on Rogue and just said, like piece for piece, what would this have cost me? And it was twenty five grand. Jeez. Right now, again, that's not even in the grand scheme of things. That's not even that much for a total gym build out. That's no. just what I got from them. So, like that difference of twenty two thousand dollars is massive. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And I actually had that before. Like, I had that, and I just squirreled it away. Even same thing. Like the first set of dumbbells before I actually even opened up on my garage, I knew. Again, I kind of planned. Uh, in the future that that was going to happen. So from that point, I started thinking, all right, I'm going to start wanting equipment. And I I started buying stuff, again, when um, when it was available, not when I needed to. Because yeah. if I waited to buy equipment until the day, you know, until two months before I was going to open, I was going to have to make it. Uh, more expensive purchase yes. or I wasn't going to find it. Exactly. So I found dumbbells that were just sitting in the back of my garage, like, almost 18 months before I ever opened up. Oh, okay. Right? Again, because I got them for like 25% of what they would cost brand new. Yeah. Right? And same things, little things here and there, right? Like you hear about this. Okay, this person has this. This person has that, right? And then over time, like I still have plenty of that stuff yeah. there because it doesn't, again, steel doesn't go bad, right? Like, um, and then other things, um, as things have gotten better and I have a little more, you know, wiggle room with my budget, I'll swap some stuff out, right? Yeah. All right, we use these bars. These are great, but these are a little bit nicer bars and people would people that know would appreciate the difference. Some people don't know or care, but people that do really appreciate the fact that, you know, I'll invest and reinvest in equipment all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes, uh, again, I also have a, a limited amount of space, 
right? So I can't just keep adding. So it's usually, I'm kind of in a one in, one out yeah, okay. thing right yeah, now where yeah. everything, I'm at a point now where um, in order to add something, I've got to, I've got to sell or, or give away something else. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and that goes with straw man equipment too. Like I said, I started off buying as much big dog stuff as I possibly could before, uh, before they are no longer making it on a regular basis. And that stuff's just bulletproof. Oh, I, fell in, I fell in love with that stuff when, at nationals when he used it, and I saw that dumbbell being dropped from overhead by the all the athlete field, like for two, you know what I mean, for that yeah. entire day. And I was like, I looked at, it, I was like, that thing's still in one piece. Yeah, right. So I was like, okay, I got to find out. And that's actually where when uh, Johnny and I first met, we've okay. been great friends ever since yeah. then. But yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, that's the, I remember moving. I think it was when I moved over here. I remember getting a quote for a yoke, and I was like. Damn, I don't have that much right now, but it's like, but I really want it. Yeah. And I never pulled the trigger on it. And I, and I kick myself all the time because those yokes were absolutely indestructible. Oh my God. They're hit, fantastic. Hit that yoke too, it, all around the world I've been, that's the best yoke. And everybody I've talked to that's used it, it was like the big dog yoke is the best yoke in the market. Big right? dog like yoke and the big find, dog frame. Yeah. They're, the frame, yeah. I like, think like just fantastic stuff. Yeah. stuff. Well, do you, do you, um, because obviously you, you're an active coach within the gym. Do you have people who also come in and do client stuff? Do yeah. They, do, so do you rent the space type of thing? I do. Yep. So technically I'm the only member or only employee of Titan Barbell. Yep. Yep. Uh, the other coaches that come in are independent contractors. Nice. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, a couple of friends of mine, Adam and Chuck. They um, are the probably the two most regular coaches out of there. Um, Adam has, uh, has a powerlifting background. He's kind of transitioned. He does some more jujitsu now. So he'll work with people both, uh, that are training cross training for jujitsu as well as getting ready for powerlifting meets. Nice. And Chuck has an Olympic lifting background and kettlebell sport. Um, and we'll do a lot of that. So generally between the three of us, we have, you know, kind of your strength sports covered. Yeah. And then all of us also work with, you know, I call them like general strength and conditioning yeah. clients. Right. So we will all work with, with anybody. And then from there, if somebody says, I really want to learn how to Olympic lift. All right. I set them up with Chuck. If I, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. if they want to really say, all right, I want to get, uh, I want to do a powerlifting meet. I'll either look at my schedule or, or have Adam, uh, work with them. And then obviously strongman is, is my specialty. So I'll work yeah. with them. Yeah. Have you had, how, how's that been, like, have you ever had any challenges with it? Because, like, what was one thing that I did with my place was, like, had some trainers in there, and it was, a, at times, it was challenging just from, like, different personalities and all that sort of stuff. Have you ever, ever ran into anything? No, not really. Nice. Uh, that's not entirely, not with them. Yeah. Right? Part of yeah. it is because, you know, I've had a working relationship with them even before I opened up my own space. Got you. Um, but, but general person, I mean, we're not all the exact same person, yeah. but we all get along. I, I get along with a lot of people and, um, but, uh, I have had, I, I have had one or two coaches where, um, actually only, only one time where like somebody just kind of like, basically was just acting unprofessional with a mm-hmm. client, like n- not illegally or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, just yeah. more of like not showing up on time or cancel, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. To a point then where I end up just eating a bunch of sessions and just doing it like, and kind of, because again, like legally there was no reason for me to do any of that. Yeah. Right. Like the, 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 the agreement wasn't between me and this person. Mm-hmm. Right. But I just said, I don't want this person's lasting image of, of Titan barbell to be negative. Well, that's the so thing. I ended up, you know, doing sessions at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Right. And just because I don't want that to, to be out there. Well, and that's the problem. Like you, as soon as they have a bad experience with someone related to the gym, now the reviews is just coming back to the gym mm-hmm. with them. Um, with all the sports that you guys cover, how, how do you feel has changed your membership? Like, has, has like, you know, saying like, you know, um, you know, you've got the kettlebell sport and you've got the Olympic stuff and powerlifting and strongman with yourself. Yeah. Has that expanded the relationship or not the relationship, the member base um, because of that? Definitely. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when we were out of the garage, it was definitely strongman and some general strength and conditioning clients. And then I think there was one small group of powerlifters okay. that Adam worked with. Um, now there's there's almost as many powerlifters as strongmen, I would say. Yeah. I'd say about that's about nice. accurate. A um, little less in the Olympic lifting realm, but we still have people that 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 do it and compete, and um, or at least at the bare minimum, add it into their training, and yeah. or maybe they're doing kind of more of a CrossFit style workout sure. as well. Uh, we'll have some people do that. Um, so in terms of the diversity of the member the member base, yeah, we have everything from 
teenagers up to we have people in their in their seventies training regularly and nice. strength wow. training and yeah. How do you feel that's changed? So, I mean, obviously, like with with the older populations as well. Is that yourself who's working with them, or just it's a mix of everybody? Uh, Chuck Chuck has some of the older clients, okay. um, but then I have worked with with uh, some older clients as well. Uh, but like I said, Chuck right now is the the one who's been working with with more of the the older um, stuff, the sixty plus, yeah. fifty five plus. Yeah. From your experience with it, how how have you? How do you? I'm trying to think how to word this. Like, what's the challenges that you face with that? Obviously, you know, they're not going to recover as quickly as, as a younger person. And I'm assuming at that point in, in uh, or at that stage with those clients, you're really just looking for quality of life gains yeah. versus really anything else. I'm assuming. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we get in some resistance. We don't have to totally, you know, throw everything out and make everything just... Um, as if they're is as, as if they're made of glass and right. Yeah, and we, sure. have to, we don't have to wrap it in bubble wrap. Right. Yeah. And I do I just realized too, I, I do have a handful of clients that are now um yeah, fifty five plus, uh sixty plus. So it's it's more yeah, they don't care about their one rep max on a squat. Yeah, exactly. Nor nor will I ever have them one rep max a squat, right? <laughs> yeah. For the record. Uh again, because because that's not what their goal is, mm-hmm. right? We do actually have some powerlifters. We have a woman who's in her 60s who's a competitive powerlifter, so she does care about her one sure, backs. Yeah. But for those that don't, it's about quality of life. It's about adding resistance training. And they know like bone density, that kind of stuff. So we do we do add in that kind of stuff. We go back to movement patterns for a lot of that. So there is a squat of some kind. There's mm-hmm. a hinge. There's a press. There's a pull. There's lunge stuff. There's twist stuff, right? So we, yeah. we get that. We get all those in with... Um, we will do some barbell variations. We will do dumbbell, kettlebell variations. We'll do a lot of sled work, okay. um, body weight stuff, TRX, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nice. So obviously with the podcast, we're, it's like, you know, unlocking your full potential in and out of the gym. Yeah. Um, and there's always one of the questions I always try and, answer, uh, or try and ask is like, what has strength sports taught you? Like how have they impacted your life from a perspective of, you know, self-image, um, determination, and all these other little intricacies that go with it. Yeah. Um, I guess it, even well before strength sports, like just uh, strength training in general, um, confidence is a huge thing that came out of that. Um, I was somebody who in school struggled a lot. I have um, pretty much undiagnosed dyslexia. Okay. Right. I say that undiagnosed because it just – Back then, they just told you you were stupid, right? And I see yeah. that kind of tongue in cheek, but like that yeah. also didn't feel great at the no, time, right? Get, like, yeah. You're like, all right, you're just not very smart. Go over here, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I know all that now because my girls both have dyslexia. They both okay. got diagnosed neuropsych and all that. And and in going through that process, uh, all that I'm like, Jesus, that sounds really damn familiar, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is awesome. I'm so damn happy that they have the resources in place, and we are fortunate enough that. We were able to send them some schools that that have that. So nice. their confidence in school and their ability to uh, enjoy reading, enjoy the process. Mm-hmm. When they don't, they have uh, resources in place to help that. I just I can't I can't uh, mm, speak highly enough about how much that matters to me. Right. Um, so what I did have was strength training. Right. Yep. That confidence um, actually helped a lot. Right. Like being able to to lift and be successful in the weight room, um, help translate over to me, uh, in the classroom, right? Like, Mm -hmm. all right, persevere through the, you can do that. Right. And I, I did have some friends, even though, like I said, I, I had, you know, not the best, uh, school experience. I had some friends that kind of understood it. Like this guy isn't stupid. He just doesn't like certain aspects of him. He may need help with, right. Or like reading long paragraphs, this and that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I did, I was fortunate enough to have some friends that helped me through that. Nice. Um, and could understand that. So, um, building that confidence, like I said, to help persevere. And I, I would say the, the discipline aspect of it as well. Um, the discipline aspect of, of training and being consistent with that has helped, uh, various aspects of, of life outside of the gym as well to, to, um, just build that, that, um, structure of, all right, you want to get to this point. Here's all the things you need to do. Not unlike training. Right. Yeah. If you want to get to that goal, here's all the things you need to do. And you kind of got to look back and say, all right, here's all the things you have to do to be successful to get to that point. Yeah. And like, you know, going back to the school side of stuff and, and, and like the school experience, like 
how were you, because obviously you're a big dude. Yeah. Like, were you always a bigger kid? Because, like, for me, like, I was a bigger kid, and it was, like, you get made fun of and all that sort of stuff. So, like, you don't, you, you're in a school environment, and, like, I think before strength training, you almost feel like you just get beaten down a little bit. And then the confidence comes up because you're like, oh, yeah, I'm stronger than you. I can do this. I can do this. Um, was it the same experience for you on that side of stuff? Not as much. I was, as you said, like, I was pretty much the biggest kid in most pretty much growing up um, through high school. The only time I wasn't the biggest kid, I, I you know, it was in college, mm-hmm. right? It was the, the first time that I wasn't the biggest kid. Uh, I was amongst the, the the larger, you know, guys on the team. But yeah. um, so actually one thing, you know, I did play sports growing up, basketball, um, some flag football, baseball. I actually swam before. <laughs> like okay. I, I did some club swimming. Nice. Uh, I was actually a pretty good swimmer at one point. Um, but uh, that helped a lot. The confidence in in, in sports as well, um, with that um, translating over as well. So, um, you know, on a, what word do I want to use? I was going to say psychological. It's not really psychological. Obviously, you're very mild mannered. Yeah. You know, for me, so like when I was uh, like like in college, like in my my degree is engineering, and it was like, oh, you you have to do all these professional things and, and stuff like that. Strong was always the release of like, I can be aggressive. I can be this. Mm-hmm. I can. I'm trying to think of the word. Like I can, I can show off type of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, do you feel that a little bit where it's like, you know, this, that, it's that, that release, that aggressive release as well? Yeah, it's, for sure. So uh, ironically going back to like, you know, what forms us as human beings, right? Like, because I was always a bigger kid, um, I, I, people, I, I'd get, you know, like anybody would get picked on for various things. Right. And, uh, one of the things I, I was, uh, uh, picked on by an eighth grader and I was in sixth grade and eighth grader picked up. I just defended myself oh, God. and I got a detention and as I, and I quote, doesn't know his own strength. Right. I was literally defending myself from an older kid and I got a detention. Right. And my parents were like, we know, we know who you are as a kid, right? Yeah. Like we know, you know, they're like, you're fine. Right. And that happened one, it happened a few other times where like, I actually had a friend, you know, like whatever friends you fight. Yeah. Like I had a friend who literally like punched me in the face a couple of times. And I remember still processing it. Like I can't punch him back because I'm going to hurt him badly. Oh, well, okay. Right. And I remember like, you just have to eat it at this point. Like, yeah. no pun intended, right. Like, yeah. And I knew that like, if I was going to do that, it wasn't going to end well. Right. And again, you kind of like that forms the lens. Like I think people that aren't super big don't realize like you're under a microscope, right? Like if, if, if somebody who, and I don't mean this, whatever, if somebody who's smaller goes on a rant and like, or physically like it's on somebody's face, right? Like it doesn't, people don't process it the same way that somebody my size does. Mm -hmm. If I go berserk and get up in somebody's face or like it's physical, it's processed in a completely different way. Right. So because of yeah. that, right, and I've had, and uh, even in, in, not as much in high school, but it happened to more, again, this is more, this is more of a playful story, not a, not a serious story, but like um, when I was a sophomore, by the time I was a sophomore, so I, I was introduced to strength training the summer before my freshman year. Okay. By the middle of my sophomore year, I was the strongest kid in the school. And uh, I was playing on varsity both ways. Um, and two seniors jumped me. And I say jump me, I, again, playful jumping, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, and they tried to take me to the ground. And within about 30 seconds, I had them both on the ground, like with my hands on their chest, like holding them down, right? So like, again, I understand the like, if I want to kind of mentally, if I want to go to a point of like using my physicality, I know what I can do. Yeah. And I choose to never go there in any way, shape, or form outside of strength sports. And that was the thing like, yeah. when you're talking about like the the lens that we're viewed through as, as, as bigger people. It was the same thing like when I was working security back home in Scotland. Like I was extremely aware from talking to other guys, you know, in straw man or 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 who just worked doors in general. As a bigger person, like I was very aware of be extremely careful how you approach situations because if you get an assault charge and you walk into the court and the judge sees you and you're, you know, 
280 pounds or 300 pounds and the other person's 150 you're fucked yeah you know 100 percent um and that's the thing like so i was actually very aware of that and i never never was in court versus <laughs> a lot of the other guys were a lot yeah. of the time and that's the thing it's like you know or even like you know if someone raises their voice and you get up and you raise it back you're viewed completely differently now, now you're the aggressor because mm -hmm. now you're the bigger one you're the dominant one and all that sort of totally. stuff totally no matter how no matter how the situation started that's not how it's going to be processed by most people yeah right ironically not ironically uh a story with that was again how being able to keep my calm has helped in a situation um the arnold in 20 <sighs> I forget what year. I want to say it was like 2016, 2017. Okay. Um, the year Zach Hadge competed in the in the Open. Whatever year that was. I think that would have been... Maybe 17, 18? I think it was 17. Because I think he... when I, I think when I did... I think when I competed in 15 at heavyweight, he was like lightweight. Or I guess middle... Uh, yeah. Middle or lightweight, whatever the designation was then. And then the next year he went heavyweight and won his card. And then I think he did the Arnold. Yeah. So whenever they're 16, 17 is right. Yeah. So that year, we after he was done competing that, that last day, we all went out to dinner, went out to ice cream afterward. Came back, dropped off uh, Zach, Nick, and a few other people at the Hilton. I think I was staying with a handful of other people over at the Red Roof. Yeah. And if you remember, you know where the Hilton is in relationship to the convention center mm -hmm. across the street, right? So there was, they've actually since taken it away, uh, there was a crosswalk, a, a lit crosswalk there at the top of that kind of apex of that yep. little like hill yep. there. Yep. I know exactly. So we were at. crossing that, uh, we were crossing that street and a motorcycle came through and clearly just wanted, wanted something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Went crazy fast, right? Ended up hitting me in the arm. Okay. Um, two people in front of me, Brittany, uh, Brittany Diamond and Ryan Rook. And then we were also, um, James Deffenbaugh was randomly there walking across, like he was there. Um, and the guy slid on the motorcycle. He slid probably like, I don't know, 150 feet. The motorcycle probably slid like 300 feet. Like it was, Damn. he was going he was that going fast, fast. Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and they all got like, not James, he was off to the side, but like the other group of people I with was starting to get like angry. Like, let's go get there. I'm like, guys, calm the fuck down. Yeah. I'm fine. Right. I didn't know what happened to my, it hurt, but like, I knew it wasn't broken or shattered yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. I was like, I'm fine. Calm down. Yeah. Right. Like, so we walked over. Right. And, and I'm glad we did because the guy ended up having a gun. Oh, shit. And one of his one of his friends came before the police came. One of his friends, he must have phoned one of his friends, came to go grab his gun and, and leave right away. Oh, shit. Right. And I was like, imagine what would have happened yeah. if we would have all just been like, you know, let's go get this guy. Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, bang, bang, bang. Right. Like yeah. all of us are then, you know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Whichever way so, you want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So again, that just goes back to like, just kind of how my brain processes a lot of that stuff in terms of like de-escalation, a lot of mm -hmm. those things. Right. Because again, um, different than when I was growing up, like understanding my strength, that was a matter of like understanding your strength doesn't mean shit against the gun. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Like, yes. So that's yeah. part of, that's part of another thing of like, that's just not how I'm processed to, to handle a lot of situations. But like nowadays, even if something like that were to happen, even if it was something where like, I know this person doesn't have a weapon. You also don't know people train, people train MMA people. Like, yeah. you know, I'm not imperfect. I'm not a street fighter, right? Yeah. Like just cause I'm strong. doesn't mean that I, you know, oh, okay. yeah. I've got an iron jaw, yeah. right? Like if somebody who's trained knows how to like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I get it. And that's the thing. Like, I think that I'll, some people forget at times where it's like, People are unassuming. Yeah. You have no idea what someone does in their totally. spare time, you know? Yeah. There may be somebody who's trained MMA who's 170 pounds who can knock my lights out, you know, yeah. easily. Yeah. Right? And I understand that, right? So, like, yeah. And that's the thing, same thing for me, like, trying to be in that perspective where it's like, okay, yes, I'm frustrated right now. Yes, I'm pissed off. But what is getting in a fight going to solve, yeah. you know? Um, and that's, you know, something that, you know, you do have to figure out as you get older because yeah. you know longevity is a real thing you know yeah. it's like it's that self-preservation type of deal yeah um and there's just so much like i don't know the more you go on in life like there's so much more to lose right well, not that yes. there was ever i mean other than life like there was so much more to lose like now than there was before right like mm -hmm. you know if something were to happen and like even if it's not loss of life it's like all right this impacts me in such a way that maybe i don't have my business anymore or something would happen and all of a sudden like I don't know, something else, like, with the family, all of a sudden, you know what I mean? Like, 
all of that's not worth none of well, so nothing no confrontations now. worth giving that away for yeah and it's like you, you know, know it's like you know when you're when you're younger and it's just you your responsibility level is so much less yeah whereas now it's a case of, okay how does this impact kids wife business yeah. you know finances health whatever you know the list is goddamn endless yeah um Talking of health, how like, we touched upon it briefly earlier, not really had major injuries. What's been the worst that you've dealt with? Yeah, so I haven't had a major injury in this sense. Of, well, I've had little things. I've tore a calf, this and that, right? Like strained here and there. The biggest thing I've had is um, pretty much since I was about 17, on and off back problem, lower back really? problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've gotten somewhat, somewhat of a, a handle on it in terms of, um, I understand when it flares up and I can kind of, you know, uh, mitigate that. And mm -hmm. Andy's been helping a lot with that kind nice. of understanding, understanding that, um, part of the reason, um, that is a big reason why, uh, my deadlift is not nearly what it should be, right? Yeah. Like the elephant in the room for me is my deadlift, right? Like it's my best pull from the floor is 725, oh, right? Gosh. Which for okay. a heavyweight pro strongman is not very good. Yeah. Let's just call yeah. a spade a spade. Yeah. I know. I understand that, right? Yeah. Like I'm not hiding that. Like, on the level I can do everything else at, that number should be at least in the mid eights, if not higher. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. uh, and I understand that, but that's been something that's ultimately cost me in a lot of contests. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not for lack of trying, right? It's a yeah, matter no, of okay, like yeah. for years, like it's one step forward, three steps mm -hmm. back. Right. And I'm also at a point now in my career where like, I've had times where like I couldn't stand up straight for weeks on end mm -hmm. because of how bad it was and no amount of like, squeezing 10 more pounds out of a deadlift max is going to be worth that to me. Yeah. Um, you know, if I have to make that choice, right. If I'm in that moment, don't get me wrong. We still, tra I still train deadlift all year round, mm -hmm. right. It's with a lot lighter weight. We try to be smart about the jumps and when to be aggressive, when to pull back, but it's not something where like going back to that, like more is better thing, right. Yeah. Where some people be like, I've got to just do more to keep going up. More is not better for me in that situation. Yeah. So more, it's a matter of like, Managing whatever aspect of the deadlift is in the, in the event that I have and just kind of if I can even literally get a point not yeah. zeroing that's really like um, you know at ASM this last year I got two reps on that Ukrainian deadlift that was awesome okay. for me like was I last place yeah I'm pretty sure it was either last place or second to last place awesome I got I didn't zero that event yeah right that was a win for me even though it wasn't <laughs> yeah no I get it yeah what are you doing injury prevention wise with you know that you as you're getting older as well like are you doing yeah. ice baths are you doing like what's your go-to's yeah so a lot of it i guess i'm gonna answer that question by going back in time and <laughs> try to tell you all the things i have done <laughs> mm. since i was 17. so uh when i first got the diagnosis uh they thought that my spine hadn't fused together so i was okay. legitimately in a hard brace from uh my sternum to my pelvis Right. It's funny that you say, or not funny, but ironic you say, because there's actually a girl that I went to, to, I guess, elementary school within the UK that had the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So they put me in a brace because they thought my spine had infused together. Now, at this point, I'd already been lifting for three years, four years, right? Um, that wasn't it. I went to college. The doctors took images again. They're like, that's, I don't know who did this, but like, that's not it. Yeah. But their recommendation was just do more ab work. Hmm. Right. This is again long enough ago where it's just like you're just you don't, you have very weak abs. So legitimately, on top of playing college football and doing all that, like I was doing an extra like forty five minutes of ab work alone, specifically. Wow. Again, that ended up not being the issue. Did it help somewhat? Sure, because generally, yeah. if your abs are stronger, you generally feel a little better. Yeah. Right. Um, but that ultimately didn't solve the problem. Um, then it wasn't for years. And then I just stopped deadlifting for years because I'm like, that's literally the one thing that sets it off. Mm. I can do a stone. I can do a block press and a weird hyperextension. I can do a, an atlas stone, natural stones. I can put, put a you know, thousand plus yoke on my back, be totally fine. All of mm. those things, totally fine. Nothing axle, like you're in a weird yeah. position when you're continental in the axle, all that stuff, not a problem whatsoever. Deadlift specifically, that hip hinge, especially from the lower height, Okay. Uh, or a standard height from it feels low to me <laughs> from a standard <laughs> from a standard height um that's always been the thing that sets it off Interesting. so for years i didn't i just didn't deadlift at all mm -hmm. right um and that obviously didn't help my general strength yeah um when i did i actually came across um when i was working at ballet total fitness i, I went to a perform better seminar heard great cook talk if you i don't know if you know who great cook don't. is um and he was basically i'm just going to summarize and said like 
the basic philosophy was, or not philosophy, the idea was that what's causing your back pain isn't your back, mm-hmm. right? Go up and down the chain, right? So you're basically looking at like a lot of the stuff with the pelvis, right? The adductors, yeah. the hip flexors, the glutes, all those things. When those things aren't doing their job, that's when that strain goes to the back. Okay, interesting. Right? Yeah. So that's helped me out a ton in terms of strengthening up those muscles, like um, learning stuff through PRI, um, mm-hmm. Postural Restoration Institute, yeah. right? Um, so doing a lot of the PRI stuff has been, has been helpful for that as well. Okay. Um, so when I find myself getting to a point where I feel like that flare up may happen, I'll hit a lot of PRI stuff. I'll hit a lot of release work in the glutes, the adductors. Mm-hmm. Um, and that seems to help, yeah. help that tremendously. That's cool. Yeah. Do you do anything general, like for like any like injury prevention, like, like full body injury prevention? Yeah. Is there specific things you're doing? Yeah. So, um, I don't have anything, I guess, consistently, I mean, other than, you know, your standard, like, you know, self-myofascial release. Um, I have done some cold cold tub therapy mm-hmm. before. Uh, part of it is I don't have the setup. But I, I like contrast showers, personally. Yeah. Um, contrast showers, I, I like because they're, for most people, a $0 investment. Yeah. Right? You literally just, for those that don't know, go in the shower, cold as you can, hot as you can, cold as you can, you know, three cycles of that. Yeah. You know, dry off the towel, like, um I like that again because not everybody has the the financial means or the actual physical space for a whole cold tub. Yeah. Right. If you're in an apartment and you're like, you can't have a cold tub there, right? Or yeah. like lugging up, you know, bags of ice every single time you want to do that. Uh, I've done that. I've done um, I've done some cryotherapy. I've done some sauna, some red light stuff, mm-hmm. um, general massage therapy, um, stretch work. Um, I've done acupuncture. I've, done, I've literally like checked off a yeah, lot of the boxes. Wow. Um, how was acupuncture for you? Cause I tried it and I was like, it was for, for like being a stress case. Yeah. It definitely helped on that side. I don't yeah. know how much it helped from a physical standpoint. I think, so I think that's also where I've felt a bigger impact of it. Can, can I definitively tell you that a hundred percent, I believe that like, that's, you know, the way to go for everybody. No. Yeah. But for to your point you just brought up, like I did come out of those sessions feeling like mentally and physically less stressed. And yeah. because of that, right, that the body can then kind of get to back to that that point where it can heal itself, that's awesome. Well, that, and that's right? it. And those for me as well was like, you know, you sit there and there's whatever music playing and it's chilled out and you're just sitting in a chair or laying on a table for an hour. Yeah. You just completely like zone out and, and, and you're, like you said, you walk out feeling completely re- rejuvenated. I don't want to say rejuvenated, but at least refreshed in some some way, shape, or form. Yeah, enough where it's, like, I guess maybe like a reset is almost what yeah. I, I would say, it right? It's just kind of like, okay, I've now reset, and now the body can start to, like to, to move in the direction I want. Down yeah. A little bit. Um, yeah, there was a point, like I said, in going back to what we talked about previously in terms of like, I know how to beat the hell out of myself, right? Like going into my first America's Strongest Man in 20... 2012 or 2013, I beat, the, I mean, again, it was a next level, right? Like, that was the first pro show I had done. I was like, everything is heavier. Yeah. I'm now the weakest guy in this field, mm-hmm. right? Like, that was the year, I think I took eighth. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the top six had all made the finals at World's Strongest Man at one point in their career. And the seventh place guy was a multi-time World's Strongest Man um, competitor as well. Okay. Right. So like, I'm still extremely proud of that performance. The fact that I was able to hang and I think I took two or three, like top three finishes in that. But again, because my deadlift and my log at that point too was, was not great. That's what plummeted me back down. But I was able to hang with them on farmers, stones. And I forget there was a third (coughs) event that I did well in. Okay. Right. But leading up into that contest, I remember talking to one of the people that I'd done some body work with because I was every single week, Going into that contest, I was getting a massage, I was getting acupuncture, and getting chiropractic work, right, every single week. And I, I joked to one of them, I was like, just break out the duct tape next week, right? Like, because that's what it felt like. It was just like, we're just going to keep everything together with a lot of duct tape, Dude, right? And it's funny because I literally competed. I had like a chronic hamstring tear, and I got to the point where it's like, if I compress it, it doesn't feel that bad. Yeah. And I have pictures and videos from a contest where I literally have my leg duct taped <laughs> on top of my neoprene. Yeah. Just because that's what was actually helping more, you know? Yeah. And that's part of where I started to learn about like, all right, 
this can't be the long-term solution. Yeah. Right. If I have to continually do all of this, it means something else before this was not done properly. Right. And that's part of, too, this like a general philosophy. Like when you're doing like, you know, when I, I, um, Talk to clients about like rolling, right? Like, or this is tight or that's tight. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Let's let's do some of the basic stuff. I'm not a medical professional, but let's just start based on experience. What I know. Yeah. Let's do, let's roll this, you know, stretch or like do some sort of movement around this. Yeah. And I say, all right, if if you do do this for like you know a couple of days or a week or two, I was like, if you if you're still doing this same thing for this same area six weeks from now, it's not working. It's not working. Yes. We need to go, we need to find the, the root cause. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes there is just like, like you said, rolling, you know, like getting the, you know, ball to, you know, massage your upper back or hit this part of your quad or your hip flexor. Boom. Three, three days later, you're like, awesome. That was yeah. just a weird kink. We got worked out. We're moving on. Right. But I, I don't think a lot of times people end up finding that root cause. And I think that's um, what causes a lot of people to, build up those to those bigger injuries right because yeah. they never they never went back and found that initial root cause and then that's where those bigger injuries uh in terms of just like the sustainability in the sport right you're like you do enough of those and like physically and mentally that wears on you right like I mean, coming that's, back that's from what i was at yeah you know like man another injury cool. yeah and then another tear cool <sighs> you know and it's, yeah. and it, and it is a men- it's a massive mental hurdle yeah for it's sure like, i'll take away the and, and physical as well yeah um, so I know you have to go and get back and coach yeah. people and all that sort of stuff. Uh, to wrap it up, where can people find you? Social media and all that sort of stuff. And I have a question about your social media as well. Sure. Uh, so at Titan Barbell on Instagram, uh, Facebook, I don't have an uh, X or Twitter or whatever. Um, yeah. And then my my own personal one is Cookie Monster Strongman. That was going to be my <laughs> question. I was like, where did it come from? Uh Two two things. One, uh, my love of all things cookies. I I I haven't met too many cookies. I've I've wanted to turn down, as you could probably see. Um, <laughs> uh, the other one was the first time I'd ever tried on a deadlift suit was the Inzer that bright blue Inzer one. I have one literally right? next door. Yeah, so I put on that and like I came out and I was like walking around. I was like, Jesus, I feel like Cookie Monster right now. So that's where really where it started. That's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah. thank you again for coming up. I very much appreciate it. Absolutely. And, thank uh, you. Yeah, dude, I'm excited to see what the year the year brings for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.